Church, welcome to our scattered service. When 2,606 years ago the unthinkable happened and the Babylonians sacked Jerusalem, tore down the walls and razed the temple to the ground, many of its people fled to the safety of the surrounding hills. And it was from those hills that Jeremiah, a prophet, albeit not a very popular one, looked down on the devastation and wept. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. So he laments at length, and yet and yet the prophet knows that where there is a God, there is hope. And not mere hope, but a sure and certain hope. Lamentations 3.19 I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore will I wait for him. For 11 weeks now, we have weathered the disruption of our lives in this coronavirus lockdown, prayed for the world around us and reached out where we could. But this week we have been deeply shaken by the passing of Beth Fleming, the wife of David, our new senior minister, taken by COVID-19. And although most of us have met her only a couple of times, she already was part of the family. And we know that she has now been welcomed home by the Lord, but even so, we lament our loss down here and grieve with David, Sarah, James, Callum and Andrew. Verse 25. The Lord is good to those who hope in him to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, this is how we come in worship to you today, looking down on our best laid plans, much like Jeremiah looked down on Jerusalem. We come to you sitting with our brother David and his family. We come to you from our own situations. We come to you without many words, hands empty, full of questions, emotions and uncertainty. We come to you because our hope is in you. We come to seek you. We come to hear from you. We come to worship you. We come to you in our every day and in our Sundays, in our praises and in our silence, in our acting and in our waiting. To you we come today, Lord Jesus Christ, Saviour of the world. Amen.
Hi Anna. How are you? I'm good, good today. Good, okay, I'm going to interview you now and I've got three questions for you. Um, the first one is, what will you be doing this time tomorrow? Well, because of lockdown I've got nothing in my diary, so I can do whatever I feel like doing. Great. But it's a high probability that I'll get interrupted by a telephone call for somebody wanting me to pray with them or to listen to what's going on in their life. So if that doesn't happen, I'll just maybe do some baking, sewing, writing, or go and explore rugby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of us are spending time exploring rugby. <laughs> okay, so next question then. What are your joys and your challenges? Okay, let me do challenges first. One of my challenge, or I, I think two springs to mind at this moment. One is I don't think I take enough time for me. And I think I need to think about myself a little bit more, not take too much on and just, you know, take a little time for me. And the next one is recently I've lost several key members of my family and that has knocked me really really hard and so it's kind of a period of recovery for me now in that sense hmm. what are my joys my joys are having my family around me family means everything to me but one of my great joy is i enjoy working with women and They've got their own challenges, you know, women from all walks of life. And I just enjoy praying with them and walking with them through whatever they're going through, you know, using the word and prayer to give them a pathway really in becoming, you know, who they ought to be, you know, not just living a life of being bruised and, you know, broken and battered, but, you know, living a life of fulfillment so that's my one of my greatest joy okay so how can we pray for you marcia how can you pray for me um well first of all that i'll use wisdom in doing you know what god really wants me to do and not take on too many things and feeling like an octopus and getting really tired. <laughs> yeah. And the second thing, you know, my family were facing a great time of loss. So if you could pray for me that, you know, we'll recover, it will be slow because it's been really hard, but that we'll recover and, you know, that there'll be no bitterness to the loss and, that we'll just trust God to help us to move forward, really. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me pray now. Okay. Dear Lord, thank you for Marcia. Thank you for her joy 
and that this beams out from her as I'm talking to her. Lord, we just lift her to you and we especially pray for her and for the rest of her family at this time of loss and bereavement. It's been such a, a long and difficult time for the whole family. We pray, Lord, for your, your mercy and your healing for Marcia and the whole family. Pray that they will recover and be filled with peace and joy despite their loss. And we pray too for Marcia. Thank you for all the things that she does for her family and for the people she knows and loves. Thank you that she's a great friend and encourager. And we pray that you'll give her wisdom at this time. Wisdom, how to spend her time and not to get involved in too many things, but to know how to juggle. Um, I don't know if octopuses juggle, but that might be Marcia. <laughs> Lord, lift her to you and... Um, and I'll just trust her to your unfailing love and care. Mm. Amen. 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 Thanks, Marcia. You're Thanks. welcome. The reading is from Ephesians 5, beginning at verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also should wives submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Let's pray. God the Father, eternally mysterious, we worship you. God the Son, eternally giving, we bless you. God the Holy Spirit, eternally witnessing, we adore you. Holy and glorious Trinity, three persons and one God, we magnify you forever. Amen. Loving God, you show yourself to us in so many different ways in times of joy and of sorrow, in experience of beauty and of challenge, in periods of rest and of activity. In whatever state we find ourselves in, Lord, help us to be open to experience your presence as good news and help us to respond by sharing the good news in word and action that others may know the wonders of your love. Amen. God of all hope, we call on you today. We pray for those that are living in fear. Fear of illness, fear, of lo fear for loved ones, fear of others' reactions to them. Lord, we lift up our family in Christ to you today. I pray your comfort over all those who are grieving. Particularly, we bring David and the Fleming family all to you, Lord. We lift them up to you and pray that you would just put them in your arms, comfort them, Lord, and help them to see a way forward. 
We thank you, Lord, that Beth is now with you and she is well and whole and at peace there with you in heaven. Lord, it's so difficult for the ones that are left behind, all the hopes and dreams and the plans that they had made and that we had made as a church as we were and still are looking forward to the family coming to be with us at Rugby Baptist Church. But we pray your comfort, Lord, upon them now. Amen. God of all hope, we call on you today. We pray for those that are living in fear, fear of illness, fear for loved ones, fear of others' reactions to them, anxiety about the future. Lord, may your spirit give us a sense of calmness and peace. And Father, as we look around the wider world and see what's been going on, not only with coronavirus this week, but also with the um, horrible death of George Floyd in Minnesota, United States. Lord, I pray that you would feel, fill us with the spirit of Pentecost, your spirit, Lord, so that we might cry out for justice with words that bring hope to those whose lives are at risk because of the colour of their skin and with words that reach the hearts and minds of those who cannot understand. Lord, we pray for comfort, we pray for justice, and we pray for an end to the oppression and racism that is going on still today in this world. And Father, also we pray for Hong Kong. Um, the law that have been, has been passed this week and as we hear of new political turmoil and broken promises, help us, Lord, that we might speak words that might lead away from violence and toward understanding. Help us to understand what is going on right now. And I pray for the people of Hong Kong, Lord, I pray peace upon them. Amen. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? So why has the healing of my dear people not come about? Verse 8.22 of Jeremiah. Is there no, no balm in Gilead, holy God? For we, your people, desperately need a balm, a healing, a sense that the desperate pain we are feeling will come to an end. Driven to our knees by the loss and pain, our minds and hearts filled with questions and doubts, our spirits often at their lowest ebb in these recent days, we turn to you, Father God, in desperation, knowing that only in you can we find comfort, healing, a balm for those things we cannot seem to get right on our own. And though we are not yet able to sing in our churches, we each and all can sing on our own, so we lift our quavering and tear-filled voices. There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain, but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a balm in Gilead to make the, wo the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Holy God, we remember that you have promised that nothing will separate us from your love, demonstrated to us in Jesus Christ. Help us to turn our eyes, hearts and minds to you in our moments of doubt and unbelief, when worldly pressure or circumstance become the distance between us. Draw near, we pray. Remind us of the grace that we first knew. Your healing touch, the Father's love, the Spirit's breath. Grant us courage, a faith that endures, and the sure knowledge that you are with us in our journey in, now and always. Father, be with us as we go into this new week. Help us to spread your good news and let our lives glorify you, Father. In Jesus' precious name, amen. One day in the Garden of Eden, Eve calls out to God, Lord, I have a problem. What's the problem, Eve? 
Lord, you've created me and provided this beautiful spot, these wonderful animals and that funny comic creature, the snake, but I'm just not happy. Why is that, Eve? The voice comes from above. Lord, I am lonely and I'm sick to death of apples. Well, perhaps I have a solution. I shall create a man for you. What's a man, Lord? Man will be a flawed creature with aggressive tendencies, an enormous ego and an inability to empathize. All in all, he will give you a hard time, but he will be bigger, faster and stronger than you. And while he will need your advice to think properly, he will be good at fighting, kicking a ball around, hunting fleet-footed ruminants and not altogether bad in the sack. Sounds good to me, says Eve. But isn't there a catch, Lord? Uh, yes, well, there is one, says God. What's that, Lord? You will have to let him believe that I made him first. Men and women. Always an interesting relationship. But why, in our reading, does Paul lurch from the church, which he has been discussing at length, to relationships in the household. Well, first off, it isn't actually a change of subject. We are merely zooming in on a detail of a more general theme. And the general theme is walking in wisdom. Verse 15 read, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And then zooming in, Part of this walking in wisdom is mutual submission. Verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then zooming in again, part of that submission is, um, is, is how that submission to each other works out in life at home. So verse 22, wives to your husbands as to the Lord. And verse 25, husbands love your wives. What is so important about the home that we should zoom in on that when talking about walking in wisdom? Well, as John Stott asks, what is the point of peace in the church if there is no peace in the home? If we are to live this new life together, imitating God, walking in love, walking in wisdom, and are to live it in integrity, then surely it has to span all spheres of personal life, through working life, family life, the local church family, to the big universal church family, the body of Christ. So without peace in the, the family, we will lack peace in our church family. And without peace in the church family, will we lack peace in the big family of God? There's a high calling on family life. Marriage, at its best in both Old and New Testament, is said to reflect the relationship between God and his people. Christians have to resist the message of our culture that our relationships ought to be driven by whatever feels good or to express yourself. No, all that is good in relationships reflects not my feelings or self-expression, but reflects the realities of heaven and the loving, faithful self-expression of God himself. In the first century, those observing Paul and this new fangled Christian sect weren't so sure about any of this. The Greco-Roman world was scandalized by the high regard in which the figure of Jesus and his followers in his wake held the value, witness, prayer, prophecy and ministry of women. And, and many in that culture felt that this female anarchy was undermining civil society itself. And this is the backdrop to Paul's household code. And he is arguing that actually it does work when you value women like that. Society won't fall apart and this is how it works. Now, let's not beat around the bush. This passage is controversial in the church today. 
as in society, and brothers and sisters in Christ, whom I deeply respect, quite often offer different readings of uh, this passage and other ones like it. Some argue that men and women are of equal worth, but different in temperament and function. They've been created in a complementary way, and so they pick up on the contrast here between submission and love. Whereas others insist that women and men are absolutely equal in every single way and stress the mutual submission that is clearly the starting point for it all in verse 21. And I'm going to disappoint you. I'm not going to argue for one side or the other here. What I will argue, though, is this. However you read these verses, they are as far removed from Western patriarchy as they are from Greco-Roman paganism. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. Now, can I, on the basis of this text, insist that Inger, my wife, defers to me as if I were Jesus himself talking to her? I have to admit, I'm not a brave man, so I haven't tried. But I think I can picture how she might react. And she would be absolutely right to. A much more likely reading is that the way that she submits to me is part of her submission to Jesus, just as the way that I love her is part of my love for the Lord. It is how we live our marriage before God. And this comes into clearer focus when we examine the headship that the next verse is talking about that I just read. Now, let's read, before we jump to conclusions, let's read what Paul said about Jesus' headship in the previous chapter, in chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 15. He says, We will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him the whole body grows and builds itself up in love. So, in other words, headship in this letter is not about importance or dominance or control, but about growth in love. To submit is not the same as to obey. And as I was thinking and praying through this passage, I was powerfully reminded of a conversation that um, Inger and I had 23 years ago uh, when we were just starting to, to court and be an item. And we were exploring in a conversation, we were exploring our commitments to each other. And I remember saying to her, I said, I want to help you flourish. I'm not here to get something out of you. I love you and I long to see you blossom. And I meant it. I still do. And one of my prayers for our marriage is that I have done at least some justice to that early promise. That the marriage relationships a relationship has helped Inger to grow as a woman and to be built up in love. That is the heart of biblical submission and hardship, however you read those terms. And once you see that, it is easy to make sense of the transition that Paul now makes to his charge for the husband. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To love, truly love, is to be in it for the other, not for what you can get out of the relationship. To love is to give yourself up, and no higher expression than of that, of course, than what Jesus did on the cross for his bride, the church. What he did for you and I. Our best marriages, our greatest loves, our faithful if flawed reflections of the spiritual reality of God's great love for his people and profound relationship with us. Let's look again at the way the key terms are used. What is it 
to submit. It is to give yourself up, your impulses, your preferences, to give yourself up for someone. What is it to love? It is to give yourself up for someone as Christ gave himself up for the church. Maybe then there is much less distance between those two verbs, love and submit, than we have historically recognized. But why are we surprised that this should be so? The starting point for everything, after all, is verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This way of relating to each other in the house or in the church was countercultural in the first century Roman Empire, scandalous even. It was countercultural for our patriarchal forebears in the last few centuries. It is still countercultural today. It is the way of the kingdom of God. If the husband is to take the lead, it has to be to serve his wife rather than himself and so submit to her. And yet the church, as we all know, has often used these verses to legitimize male dominance in marriage and to lock women into abusive relationships, even though dominance and abuse are polar opposites to the mutual submission that underpins everything in kingdom relationships. And I'm reminded, reflecting on this, how in Matthew 4, 6 and Luke 4, 10, even the devil himself can quote scripture to serve, own, own, to serve his own ends. But hear my voice and make no mistake. Such a gross violation of the word is an abomination to God and has no place, never has done, never will do, in his kingdom. And domination and abuse have no place in our relationships anywhere. If you have experienced abuse, physical, sexual or emotional, you need to know that Rugby Baptist Church is a safe place space. You will be loved, not judged, listened to, not lectured to, cherished, not chained to a situation that is intolerable before God. The kingdom of God. What we have entirely managed to miss so far is that these verses quietly say more about Christ and the church than about women and men. Verse 23, Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. We can look to him for salvation, growth and love. Verse 24, the church submits to Christ, that is, gives up her own priorities for his priorities, trusting that his priority is to see her, the church, flourish. Verse 25, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Greater love has no one than this. Verse 26, Christ makes her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. The word we unpack today has power to wash and sanctify our relationships. We've got to believe that. Verse 27, Christ presents her, the church, to himself as a radiant church. The Son of God left his home in search for a bride and he did not return without one. Verse 29, Christ feeds and cares for the church, for we are members of his body. You and I, we are individually known and loved by him. And he works for our good to build us up in love. Verse 32, Christ and the church become one. The Bible says that we are in Christ already, but the fullness of that yet awaits. When the final day has come and gone, we will be in his presence, in a relationship and love more profound than any we have ever known. Last Wednesday, I read a news item about Nancy and Eric Kingston. It was their 80th wedding anniversary. They first met, I'm told, on a blind date in 1937. 
And in that interview, Nancy said, it must have been a deep love to have lasted this long. We don't do it like they do today. We hung on. It's been a long time, a wonderful time. We've been very lucky. We're still going strong. Well, I've been married for a mere 21 years and can only imagine how deeply entwined your lives can be after four times that. Yet, for all that, their relationship after those 80 years is just a drop in the ocean compared to what awaits us all in God. We are the church. We've been more than lucky. We've been saved. We are loved. So hang on. Let love rule in our homes, in our church and in our lives. Don't look to our culture for relationship tips. Look to Jesus. Serve each other and submit to each other. And if it doesn't quite work the first time around or the 50th, not to worry. We've got a perfect example to learn from and all eternity to practice. Let's pray. Father, we give our marriages to you. We give our singleness to you. We give all our relationships of any nature to you. And will you forgive us for putting some of those relationships before you and the norms of our culture before your wisdom? Help us to look to you for help, guidance and understanding. Search our hearts, Father. Convict us and clear out all the hardness and clutter that is clogging up the flow of love in our lives. Reset our relationship with you. Restore our hope in Jesus Christ and open our minds and hearts to the healing truth that only he is a sure guide when we are lost. We cannot change our past, Father, but we use our present to commit our future to you. Lord Jesus, give us the strength to be brave. Replace the fear of what might happen and what the future might hold with a Christ-centered courage. Many of us can't be strong right now. Some are broken, hurting and barely breathing, but you, the living God in us, are our strength. We pray especially for those among us who have experienced abusive or domineering relationships. We pray for those who have experienced racism or violence. Heal our wounds, Lord, and teach us the kingdom way of relating to one another. And Holy Spirit, will you come and empower us with humility, gentleness, patience, peace and unity? Will you curb our anger from morphing into bitterness and division? Lord, forgive us for the times when we lose our tempers and our sanity in our relationships. And we pray especially, Lord, for our marriages, that they may reflect more of Christ's love for the bride, the church. Lord Jesus, will you build us up in love? We are the church, your church. Amen.
everyone, I'm Emma, Rugby Baptist Church Secretary and this morning I've got some really sad, sad news to share that many of you will already know and that is that Beth Fleming died on Wednesday evening earlier this week. Um, she had been critically ill in intensive care uh, for a fortnight having suffered from the COVID-19 virus a couple of months ago from which she never fully recovered. So that is quite dreadful news really. Um, on the front of our newsletter this week, Peter quoted a verse from our reading last week from Ephesians. Um, Wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And he went on to say, know this, in God's time and goodness, the scattered will be gathered, the lost will be found and the sleepers will indeed rise from the dead. Let's just pray for a minute. Dear Lord, we pray for all who may feel bewildered at this news. And especially, Lord, we pray for David and for the whole family. May they know your peace and comfort through this mighty storm. And for all of us, Lord, Help us to know how to love and care for them. Amen. I was thinking that if we were meeting in church, we'd probably have a huge card and we'd probably all be writing messages and prayers, Bible verses that we've been thinking about and all sorts of things, other messages um, to try and convey to them that they're in our thoughts and prayers and and how much we care for them but we obviously can't do that um, because we're not meeting but let's try and do something so if you let me have your messages then I will put them together and send them to David um, it isn't really anything at all is it but it's it's something that will show that we're thinking of them so if you've got a message that you'd like to be included please will you let me have it by the end of Sunday that is Sunday the 7th of June um, and I'll put them all together and send them off to David. You can email me, text me, send me a WhatsApp message, private message, give me a ring, pop it on a piece of paper through my front door, whatever way you can find to let me know what message you would like me to include from you and then that will be a card from all of us at Rugby Baptist Church. If you're watching this before 10.45 on Sunday the 7th of June then you're in time to join together for communion over Zoom if you would like to. The link to join is in the newsletter and also on Facebook. If that's not going to work for you then you might like to use the same words that we'll all be using which you should have had that in um, with your newsletter this week. This coming week, Peter is on holiday, so I'd just like to wish him a happy, peaceful and restful week from all of us. And I hope that he has a relaxing break. I hope you all have a good week and I'll see you next time. Let's close with these words from Hosanna by Hillsong. Heal my heart and make it clean. Open up my eyes to the things unseen. Show me how to love like you have loved me. Break my heart for what breaks yours. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause as I walk from earth into eternity. Lord Jesus, as we enter a new week, make our hearts like yours. And by your Spirit, empower us to live our lives as citizens of the kingdom and lovers of all that is good and true, privately, in our homes, in our streets, and reaching out to our world, crying out for good news. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.